And good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Well, so welcome to the second class of ECEN 3010, MCEN 3017, um, Circuits and Electronics. My name is Bill Newhall. Our first day, our first lecture was a snow day, so, uh, so we're catching up now. But actually, we shouldn't have too much catch up to do because I posted a video which went through most of the intro material. So I hope you watched that. If you, if you didn't watch that, um, please take time after the lecture uh, to watch that intro video that discusses the logistics of the class and grading scales and things like that. But today we're gonna dive right into uh, just a little bit of intro and uh, the material itself. I usually start out class with announcements, so I'll do some announcements. So just check the uh, assignments so in Canvas, you go to the assignments page and you can see all the assignments that are upcoming. You have uh, pre-lab one due this Thursday. For pre-lab one, each student submits a pre-lab. That's unusual for this pre-lab or for a pre-lab. Usually each team submits a pre-lab, but, but for pre-lab one, each student should submit a pre-lab uh, according to the instructions. And then there's uh, quiz one, which is due Friday. Uh, and then homework one is due Monday. And now these are pretty basic problems. And I'll, uh, you know, I discussed in the video that the quizzes are basic and they build up to the homework and you'll be able to see the quiz answers before you work the homework. So that should help you out there. So take a look at those assignments. Um, uh, for homework, be sure you, you check the date or for all the assignments, the date and the time that they are due. Uh, there's a date and time listed for all assignments. Uh, for the book, make sure you're working problems out of the seventh edition of Hambly, okay? Not the global edition or international edition. Those editions are different. Uh, they don't have the same homework problems. So make sure you have, uh, I'll say regular seventh edition. I just know that the regular seventh edition does not say global or international on it. Um, for picking up your kit, your TA should have described, I think your TA did describe that you will need a kit uh, for this class uh, for lab. And the e-store hours are Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, and so you can pick up your kit there. It, you only need one kit per team uh, for lab. Also, there's a Slack page. So be sure to join the Slack page if you want to answer any ask or answer any questions about homework or any assignments or discussion on the exams when those come up. So, so check out the invitation link on Canvas uh, where it says Slack. Uh, let's see, my office hours will be right after class if you want to just say hi or have questions or just want to listen in. So come on and join right after class. I'll just keep the, the Zoom session up and running and we'll start office hours right after class. If you have any questions during class, chat, shoot me a chat, um, uh, unmute, um, you know, shout out your, your question. Uh, it may take me some time to see your chat uh, question or if, if your chat question's up and I wanna wait for the next kind of segue, then um, uh, that might be a small delay, but if it looks like I didn't see your question, definitely shout out your question. Um, otherwise, please stay muted to keep your background noise low. Okay, so I wanted to introduce myself a little more. I know I said my name and my email on the recorded video, uh, but I think it's a good idea to know who your instructor is when you're taking a class. So here is who I am. So I am an electrical engineer. Um, I work specifically on radio frequency electronics, RF electronics, and I've been doing this for about 27 years now working specifically on RF electronics and RF electronic systems. I've done some microcontroller work, I've done some software work, I've done some analog design, but um, my, my career has been uh, electronics and leading electronics programs. And at the same time, I've enjoyed teaching for the last, about the same time, about 25 years um, as, uh, as adjunct faculty or an instructor at, while I'm working as an engineer in industry. And I think one perspective I can bring to this class to you is that I work with mechanical engineers nearly every day. Um, I'm, I'm working on programs, I'm working on projects, 
uh, that have mechanical engineers and, and other engineers, software engineers, um, thermal engineers, and, and we develop electronics products. And I ask mechanical engineers periodically, uh, what do you wish you learned when you came out of college that would have made your starting up in a job easier? Or, or even what do you wish you know now that, you know, that you've been a mechanical engineer for 10 years and you wish you knew a little more about electronics? I ask those questions and I try to incorporate the, uh, that material into this class. All of that material doesn't fit into this class because this is intro. Um, we're actually developing, I'm actually developing a class that may be held this fall um, if, if you have any interest in electronics beyond this class. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested. But my intent with this class is actually to leverage my engineering experience that I have in industry um, and teaching and to help you learn the electronics fundamentals um, that I think are useful for mechanical engineers. And I hope to bring in practical examples where they're relevant where they apply um, and, and where they apply to mechanical engineers and where, where it might help you again in your career um, or your research or even non-EEs that are other types of engineering uh, disciplines. So I'm enthusiastic about teaching. I say using the latest resources. Um, I've been teaching this class uh, remotely uh, well since what, about 2020, but I've done videos for the class before that when I was teaching it live and we get pretty good reviews um, for teaching it remotely because I can juggle the whiteboard and the slides and show some examples and bring in some real hardware every once in a while. Um, and so that's, it's been working out pretty well. Actually, the reviews have been leaning toward doing it remotely versus um, in the classroom. But so we'll continue that for this semester. So that's who I am. Um, we talked about the course and the course logistics. I talked about it in the uh, in the recorded video. If you haven't seen that, please take a look at that. It explains a lot of details that are pretty important about when to turn assignments in and, and things like that. So take a look at that, please. So uh, let's see, let's dive right into talking about uh, circuits and circuit variables and give an intro to this material. I would like to start out with a little bit of a motivational speech on why should a mechanical engineer or any non-electrical engineer be learning circuits? Well, in a nutshell, uh, electrical circuits are part of many engineering problems and solutions, whether you're developing a product or whether you're doing research and just need instrumentation, let's say. And I like to say that uh, not having a basic understanding of electrical concepts can be as restricting as uh, not having an understanding of basic mechanical concepts, right? I, I uh, like mass, force, and velocity. Many of you may have this feel, understanding for electrical concepts like voltage, current, power already, and that's great. I hope to strengthen that. Um, but but coming out of this class, it, uh, I hope to st uh, strengthen that. And if you don't have that feel already for it, uh, then I hope to strengthen your understanding of voltage, current, power what that means. The example I like to give is let's suppose you and I are working on an engineering team and we're developing some kind of drone, right? Some kind of, I don't know, quadcopter, something like that. And, um, and I'm working with you, I'm an electrical engineer, and you're saying something about force. And I'm thinking F equals MA, what are the equations? Well, no, you're talking force, right? You have kind of a intuition about what force is and, and velocity, right? And I'm thinking as an electrical engineer, velocity, what is that? That's the derivative of displacement and distance versus time. Well, no, we're talking about speed, right? So, so, so um, that's what I'd like to, if you don't already have the feel, and many of you do for um, you know, voltage, current, power, I'd like to kind of understand those, those concepts. Like pretty much we all understand um, mass, force, and velocity, as well as the magnitudes of those, the, the values of those quantities, right? If I said we're building a, you know, a drone and that drone has to achieve a maximum speed of, I don't know, 35 miles an hour, you'd say, okay, it, uh, it seems reasonable, right, for, for a drone. But if I said that drone has to achieve 3,500 miles an hour, you'd say, well, that doesn't make sense, right? Because that's a different drone. That's, you know, if this is sort of a quadcopter that you, you've just exceeded the speed of sound, you've gone like excess of hypersonic here. So that doesn't make sense. 
So, you know, many of you have a feel for voltage current power, you know, you know, is, is, is a microamp reasonable? Is an amp reasonable? Is 100 amps reasonable or a mega amp, right, for the circuits you're working on? That's what I'd like you to have the feel for, and I'll help you with that throughout this class. So this will all help you, I hope, I plan, to work with electrical engineers, to work with electrical and mechanical systems and do those kinds of designs, lead engineering teams, and also just have a larger systems engineering, systems design knowledge to make a bigger impact with your career. So, um, so I think it's worth it to have a circuits class in, in your background. And so that's what we're going to work on this semester. So let's talk about applications of circuits. Why do we even care about circuits or, or use circuits? Um, well, a very straightforward, very general definition is that we use electrical circuits to do work. Okay, so what does that mean? We can divide that into two categories. Um, deliver energy is one of those categories, right? What's that mean? That means to light, heat, and move things, to deliver energy from one place to another, to move something, to heat something, to light something. Usually the source of energy for the AC power system, right? If you're thinking about moving something with an AC motor or heating something with a, a, an AC you know, wall outlet heater, you're moving energy from one place to another. You're moving energy from the power plant, right? You're taking natural gas, you're taking coal, you're taking the sun, solar, you're taking wind, you're taking nuclear. That's the source of the energy. And the electricity is just a way to move that energy from one place to another with a little bit of loss in between, but you're moving the energy from the source to a load. And that load might be the heater, it might be the motor. So you're delivering energy using an electric circuit that carries charge. And we'll talk about that a little bit, a lot. Um, we also use circuits to represent information or transmit, receive information. So to sense things, to communicate data, to store data and to control things, right? So that's what we do. Um, so it takes energy to move a bit of information down a wire, down an ethernet cable. So you're, you're, you're applying a voltage, you're sending current, that's power, that's energy. Um, so we use electrical circuits to do work, which includes representing information and transferring that information uh, from one place to another. Okay, so really they're both the same thing, doing work, but just a little bit different ways of thinking about it. Okay. All right, so, and if you have any questions, any comments, shout them out. I'd be happy to, to talk about things. Um, so let's dive into schematics, what, right? Let's, let's talk about our first circuit and schematics. So the actual circuit in cartoon form would look something like this. So here's a car, an old car, with headlights connected to a battery controlled by a switch. So you could draw this kind of diagram. This, this represents the physical layout and some of the electrical connections um, con connecting that uh, battery to the headlights through the switch. What we're going to do generally in this class is not represent the physical properties, physical characteristics of the circuit, but we're going to extract only relevant electrical information. And we're going to extract that into what we call a schematic. A schematic is uh, a diagram, it's a circuit diagram that consists of circuit elements and conductors. And actually we'll call those, we will call those nodes, N-O-D-E-S, nodes later. So circuit elements are things like the 12 volt source that might be a battery, the switch, a switch. Um, resistors, we'll talk about resistors or resistors representing other devices like headlamps or headlamps themselves. themselves. So that schematic, when I say schematic, I mean circuit diagram. And that circuit diagram represents electrical characteristics. And the physical characteristics like sizes, lengths, shapes, placements, orientation, and angle, those are generally not represented in schematics. Okay. So, so when you see two resistors kind of connected, aligned here, that doesn't mean physically on the circuit board, they have to be aligned. They can be 
at different points on the circuit board. So we're just extracting electrical information to put into the schematic. Okay, so this class will all be about working with three values, everything we do the whole semester. Uh, we're going to be talking about current, voltage, and power. These are called circuit variables. So when a, when a problem says solve for these circuit variables, it means solve for these values of voltage, current, and power. And we know, right, the purpose is to uh, do something useful, right? So usually we're calculating voltage, current, power to do something useful, and we'll talk about applications. Um, so you're going to calculate these values, you're going to measure these values in these labs, in, in the labs. You're going to design for these values um, when you're given specifications in lab and do that during your pre-lab. And so this, these three circuit variables apply whether you're talking about sources like batteries or Thevenin equivalents, we'll get to that, like um, connecting receivers, uh, uh, to, uh, like an audio amplifier to a speaker or an antenna to a receiver, right? That's, that's all, all those, um, um, uh, th these applications deal with current voltage and power. We're going to talk about sinusoidal analysis. That's AC voltage, AC current. We're going to talk about transistors and op amps. Those are semiconductors and integrated circuits. Again, we'll be calculating voltage, current, power. We'll talk about digital applications where circuits are making decisions for you using logic gates. Again, current, voltage, power, and motors. Finally, the physical world will connect um, well, voltage, current, and power to uh, m motors, either DC motors, stepper motors, or servo motors. Okay, so we're so that's all coming up. But um, you'll hear me talk every day about current, voltage, power, and that applies all across these applications. Okay, someone says the Slack join request is not working. I'll take a look at that um, right after class and see if we can get that working. Okay. So let's just start right into these circuit variables. Let's start with talking about current, right? We're gonna go through current, voltage, power. So current, electric current is the flow of positive electric charge. It's the flow of charge, it's the flow of some quantity called charge. The units of current are amps. We usually say amps or microamps, milliamps. The real unit is amperes. So to visualize this, imagine you have a cross section of a wire. I have a cylinder drawn here as a cross section of a wire. Um, or I should say a segment of a wire and I have a cross section drawn here. If I do something on either ends, on both ends of the, this wire to cause electrons to flow from right to left, electrons, electrons are negatively charged. So I would say if I have electrons going right to left, I have current going left to right, right? Electrical engineers don't talk about electron flow. We talk about positive charge flow, right? Typically physicists, in physics, you probably learned about electron flow. And so there's probably a negative sign on every equation you've ever learned in this class. But what we talk about when we talk about current flow is the flow of positive electric charge. Okay, and charge is this variable Q of T. Okay, so charge, um, you can either view it as the flow of electrons or the flow of holes. We define it as the flow of holes, the flow of positive charge or absence of electrons. After a while, you just kind of stop thinking about that and you, uh, we accept that current is positive charge flow, but Q of T is the charge through this cross section right here. Okay, so it's like if I had water flowing through a pipe, it would be the number of gallons of water that passed through that cross section. Okay, you could, you could measure that, right? You can measure how many gallons went past this cross section. That's analogous to how much charge went past this cross section. Current is the flow of charge. Um, so current is actually the derivative of charge, the time derivative of charge. So I is equal to Q, I'm sorry, I is equal to dq dt. It's a flow in coulombs per second. So if the unit of charge is coulombs, then the rate of flow is coulombs per second. Just like if I were dealing with water through a pipe, right? 
right? Gallons as the quantity that's flowing, but the rate would be gallons per minute, something like that. So gallons per minute, quantity per time, this is coulombs per second, this quantity of charge per time. When we define a current, we always define a reference direction, right? It matters which way water's flowing through a pipe. Is the tank emptying or is the tank filling? Current is sort of analogously the same way, right? We have to define a reference direction. And that would look something like this. If I have a wire, right? I'm not drawing it three-dimensionally now. I'm just drawing a line. I have a wire. I just have two points marked on that wire. And I want to indicate I have two amps flowing, right? two coulombs per second flowing through that wire. Then I could do that like this. You write two amps, you indicate the direction of that two amps. Okay, so two coulombs per second is flowing from A to B, left to right, through this wire. Now, it would be just as valid to say this, that I have negative two amps flowing from right to left, okay? If you reverse the reference direction, all you need to do is put a negative sign in front of the quantity next to the reference direction, and mathematically, everything will work out fine. There's no requirement. In fact, it's often not preferred to try to make all your arrows align with positive numbers. I recommend not doing that. Just We'll, t we'll work these problems, but when you define a reference direction or one is defined for you, you just go with it. And if you get a negative value, that's okay. So in this case, if you have two amps going from left to right, you have negative two amps going right to left. Both answers are right here for describing the current. I can describe current with a variable. Here's a variable I1. I've indicated a reference direction. If I match that reference direction with the known current, I know I1 equals two amps, okay? You could have drawn a variable here and said I2, and I want I2 to go the other direction. That's fine. I2 has the same reference direction as negative two amps, so I2 is negative two amps, okay? There's a notation we use with two subscripts. For example, IAB. Um, IAB is called double subscript notation, which I'll talk about in a minute. But first I wanna indicate that IAB, since the reference direction is the same as two amps, IAB must equal two amps, okay? Um, IBA, and, and let, me, let me go back here for, to IAB. IAB is this, well, let me bring up the definition here. Double subscript notation means this, that the subscripts indicate the reference direction implicitly. In other words, IAB is the current going from the first subscript to the second subscript, so from A to B. That's why the reference direction for IAB has to be drawn like this. It has to be drawn from A to B along the wire. IBA, again, the first subscript where the current's coming from, the second subscript's where the current is going to. So IBA comes from A to B. So the reference direction for IBA has to be B to A. Okay, so IBA would be negative two amps. Okay, so that's just some notation. Um, you'll see that uh, probably the big takeaway is, is that current is the flow of electric charge, positive charge. Electrons go the opposite direction, but we won't worry about that too much. And then this notation down here, you'll see that show up in some problems. All right. All right, so let's move on to voltage, right? Current voltage power. Voltage is a measure of energy transferred per unit charge when charge moves. It's the potential to do work. That's a... That's an exactly correct definition that doesn't really describe too much to give you a feel for what voltage is. Um, uh, voltage is like if you had a water wheel, right? Water going over a wheel, going from a high height to a low height, right? Potential is the energy that 
a quantity of that water could transfer when that water moves from a high place to a low place, right? The voltage is kind of like the, the potential energy difference between those two points at the top of the water wheel and at the bottom of the water wheel. And work is only done, energy is only transferred for a water wheel when water moves, right? That's sort of like voltage. It's a lot like voltage, except instead of water, we're talking about charge, charge flow. So we'll get back into that in just a second, but let me say that voltage is always measured between two points, like the top and the bottom of a water wheel. Voltage is always measured between two points and it has a polarity, like which is the top and which is the bottom of the water wheel. Okay, so getting back to an electrical example, um, let's suppose we have a circuit element X, right? This could be a light bulb, it could be a battery, it could be a solar panel, it could be a motor, it doesn't matter. It's just, I'll show these boxes and it doesn't matter what these boxes are. And I have two wires connected to this box. I could define a voltage across this circuit element. And let's suppose I just know it or I've measured it or somehow I'm gonna make it happen. This voltage is defined with a quantity or a variable. In this case, Vx is the variable, 12 volts is the quantity of the voltage, right? The units are volts or millivolts, microvolts. So here's the voltage quantity, but I need a polarity also. And that says that on top here where the plus is, it's not always red, where the plus is, that has a higher potential than where the minus is, okay? It shows which end of the water wheel is higher, right? Which uh, sort of. So, um, so that's a way to define a voltage. And what this really means that if I cause positive charge to flow, Right, if I cause charge to flow through the circuit element somehow, right, it's connected to a bigger circuit. If I cause charge to flow, which is current, I'm going to transfer energy. Energy is going to be transferred from the circuit itself, either to or from the circuit element X. Okay, so in this case, 12 volts means 12 joules per coulomb, right? Go back up here, 12, it's, it's right. How, how much energy is transferred per unit charge, joules per coulomb, which is 12 volts. If one coulomb of charge flows through X, then 12 joules are absorbed by X. In other words, absorbed means if that's a resistor, it got hot. If that's a light bulb, it lit up, right? Energy was transferred or absorbed to or absorbed by X, okay? So that's an example of energy transfer. And I know how much energy is transferred because I know the voltage and I know how much charge flowed through that circuit element. Okay. Now, something you might have heard about voltage with respect to polarity is current flows from positive to negative. I will show you lots of examples where that's not the case. Voltage does not necessarily indicate the direction of current flow. So voltage does not always flow from positive to negative. And again, I'll show you examples of this. And here, here's, here is a case. I could have a circuit element Y, same voltage, same polarity, right? Plus is on top, minus is on the bottom. And externally, right, connecting this to some other circuit, I could cause positive charge current to flow the other direction instead of top to bottom, bottom to top. So the current's going in the opposite direction. And in this case, well, something different happens. I still have 12 joules per coulomb of energy transfer, but if one coulomb of charge flows through this circuit element, then 12 joules are supplied by Y, right? Not absorbed. So we'll talk about this in more detail when we get to power, but if you have a voltage, the energy transfer, whether it's absorbed by that circuit element or supplied by that circuit element, it all depends on the relationship between the polarity and the direction of current flow. I wanna point that out, but we'll, we'll get to that. The, the point here is that voltage is really, it's a potential difference. It's a potential to do work. Um, and it, uh, it, it indicates how much energy is transferred given you know the amount of charge that flows through. I mean, again, think about X as being a light bulb, 
right? It's absorbing. So it produced light for a certain amount of time. So much energy got absorbed and then radiated as light. The case on the right is like a battery. So here, maybe you connected a battery to something and that battery supplied so much energy for a certain amount of time. And that's a case of supplying uh, energy by the circuit element. Okay, so voltage, um, let's talk about polarity a little bit. If, if you know the voltage, that's the actual polarity. So let's suppose I've measured this voltage across the circuit element between terminals A and B. I've measured it to be 12 volts. That's the actual polarity of the voltage. We're going to talk about reference polarity. Reference polarity is a polarity chosen for a voltage variable without knowing the actual polarity, okay? So let's suppose I don't know 12 volts. I just, I, I, I don't know what it is, I cross that out. And I need to determine a voltage across X. Well, if I'm given a choice to determine the polarity of the variable, I can choose plus on the left or plus on the right, it doesn't matter. Mathematically, when you analyze the circuit, you'll get you'll get um, the right answer, um, and we'll talk about that. But in this case, if my polarities match, like to the actual polarity, then V1 equals 12 volts. Let's suppose you decided you weren't given a polarity, and you decided you wanted to use the opposite polarity. Right? Put plus on the right, minus on the left. Call your variable V2. Well, since V2's polarity is the opposite of the actual polarity of a known voltage, then V2 is negative 12 volts. Both answers are right, right? Both answers are right. Now, if I give the polarity in a homework problem, right, use that polarity. But if you're asked to choose a polarity, like in lab, and you're working through your lab, both of these answers are right. They both mean the same thing. Um, and if you use the analysis techniques that we're going to talk about, and include this variable, they will all work. It's just, you're using an opposite polarity. A reference polarity is just a polarity chosen for a voltage. And if the, if the reference polarity is opposite that of the actual polarity, you get a negative sign, okay? There's double subscript notation for voltages. So here is VAB, it's using double subscript notation. The first subscript indicates where the positive sign goes right, for that variable. The second subscript indicates where the negative sign goes for that variable. So that means that uh, the plus goes on the A side because A is first. The minus goes on the B side because B is second. So here, VAB would equal 12 volts when you compare VAB to the actual voltage. You, you can define VBA. Again, the double subscript not notation says B is where the positive sign goes. The first subscript is where the positive sign goes. So the positive sign goes on the B side, which is why the plus is here. The negative sign goes on the A side. So that's why it's over here. So VBA is negative 12 volts. Okay, so just some information on what you're going to see when voltages are defined with variables and reference polarities in these problems that we work and in, again, practical applications. So let's talk about a notation that I don't like and I'd recommend not using. Some places in your book, especially in the beginning chapters, you'll see a V and a curved arrow. The book introduces it. It's rare to find anyone use this, using this outside of this textbook. And it's easily, I think, confused with current because that looks like a reference direction for a current to me. So I recommend not using, you know, you're gonna, you might work some example problems or homework problems where voltage polarity is indicated like this. But what it means is this. It means that um, plus is on the left where the arrow is and the minus is on the right where the tail is. And again, I never use the arrow. I will always use this here. 
and I recommend doing that. Okay, so let's talk about different types of voltages. So there's AC voltage and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let's talk about current first. Let's talk about alternating current and direct current, AC current and DC current. So let's suppose I have a circuit element. I have current flowing through that circuit element. If that current is alternating current, then it is time varying and it reverses direction periodically, okay? So a plot of AC current might look like this, right? So it's time varying, not constant. And the current changes between a positive value and a negative value, which means currents first for half cycle going one direction, and then the other half cycle going the other direction. It's going back and forth through the circuit element for alternating current. Direct current uh, would look something like this. So direct current is constant with time and flows in one direction. So this would be a plot of direct current, right? Current versus time. So I have six amps. It's always six amps. It stays six amps. It doesn't change, it flows in one direction. That's direct current. Okay, so that's the difference between AC and DC. You can also apply this concept to voltages. And that's a little weird because, right, an alternating current voltage and an alternating or a direct current voltage, that's a little weird to say, but it's usually implied to mean an AC voltage is a voltage associated with an AC current, an alternating current. A DC voltage is a voltage associated with a direct current. And it's what you would expect out of the plots. An AC voltage is time varying and reverses polarity periodically. So here's the same plot except voltage versus time. The voltage is changing, it's not constant. And the voltage polarity changes well from a positive voltage to a negative voltage, right? So which means it's actual polarity is changing versus time. And so that's what you would see for an AC voltage. A DC voltage is constant with time and has constant polarity. So 12 volts voltage versus time would look like this. So that's a DC voltage. Okay. All right, any questions on voltage, voltages or currents? We're still gonna talk a little more about that, but I wanna give an opportunity for any questions on this material. All right, nothing heard, nothing seen in the chat. So let's move on to uh, a clicker question. So break out your clickers and give this a shot. So I'll, I'll tell you up front, this is more of a, a thought question than a question that has a right or wrong answer. You'll see what I mean. So you have a plot of a measured voltage. So maybe you took an oscilloscope. So an oscilloscope, which you will use in lab, an oscilloscope measures voltage versus time. It gives you a plot of voltage versus time. Let's suppose your oscilloscope gives you this on the screen where zero is right here. The axis is at zero right there. Is this voltage waveform AC, alternating current, or DC, direct current? Or is it an AC voltage or a DC voltage? And as I said, this is more of a thought exper experiment um, or a thought exercise. So, and remember that, <clears throat> so for clickers, um, there's a clicker grade. The clickers, all of the clickers count as one homework grade. If you answer questions during half of the session, you don't even have to get the answers right, right? Um, if you answer during half of the sessions, you get full credit for that homework. So I encourage you to respond. And it's a good opportunity actually to think about it and you know, try to get the right answer because I'll give you the right answer. And if you don't understand it, then um, 
uh, we can talk about it at office hours or, or whenever. So uh, let's see, someone asked, um, so I don't have access to the course iClicker. How do we answer the clicker question? So let's see. So you can, uh, so stop, if you don't have a clicker and you don't know how to get it, stop by office hours. Um, and don't worry if you miss this session because we will have several of these, so it won't matter. All right, so I think if you search um, ECEN 3010, you should be able to get this registered on your account. Okay, all right, so let's give uh, 10 more seconds and then we'll call time on this and talk about this thought exercise here. All right. Okay, so in reality, if you look at this, you know, when I think about this waveform, uh, is it constant? No, so it's not DC. Um, does it change polarity? No, so it doesn't meet the AC criteria. So in reality, and I promise I won't do this again with any other clicker questions, but in reality, it's this. It is a, an AC waveform superimposed on a DC waveform. So this is really both AC and DC in a single waveform. So if I add the, the, the top waveform here to the bottom waveform, right, I get this, that dotted line indicates the, that, that DC waveform there. And um, so the answer is, well, both, neither, you know, it's AC and DC, you could say, but it's really the sum of AC and DC components. So I hid that answer. Again, I wanted this to be a thought question rather than what, something you could get right, but I wanted to have you to have that cognitive dissonance for a while. Um, this is not just an academic problem. This is really done. AC and DC for a real purpose. One practical example is this. If you took an oscilloscope, a high-speed oscilloscope, and you measured the voltage um, and, uh, for, uh, between the, the terminals of a coax cable, between the conductors of a coax cable, between your, let's say your satellite TV receiver and your uh, satellite antenna, right? So you got a satellite dish antenna, you got a satellite receiver, there's a coax cable in between. If you measured the voltage there with an oscilloscope, you would see an AC waveform that is elevated off of zero. And the reason is that the AC waveform is carrying the video information, the digital video information down from the antenna back down to the receiver. That's coming from antenna to receiver. But uh, the antenna has an amplifier in it. You wanna put an amplifier as close to the antenna as you can so you get the best um, signal to noise ratio, right? So that amplifier is up at the antenna and you have to power it somehow. Now, if you've ever installed a satellite antenna, you know there's no power cable to plug in for your satellite receiver antenna, your, your satellite antenna. That's because your receiver, what it does is it superimposes a DC voltage on that coax. That's actually powering the amplifier up at the up at the um, the antenna, um, and and the signal's coming down AC. So so both are superimposed on each other, and um, you you would see that on an oscilloscope. So this is done for for practical reasons. Okay, any questions on this clicker question other than not being able to answer that? We will get that worked out. Okay. All right. So uh, let's talk about measuring voltage. So how to measure a voltage V1. So let's suppose I have uh, a circuit element, I have defined a voltage variable and a reference polarity. If I want to measure V1 with a meter, that meter has a positive terminal and a negative terminal, this voltmeter. I hook the positive terminal to the positive side of the reference polarity. I hook the negative terminal to the negative side of the reference polarity like this. And that's how I would measure V1. I'm matching the polarity of the meter with the polarity of the um, variable I'm trying to mention, that reference polarity. If I see five volts on the meter, then that means I have five volts with this polarity. 
V1 equals five volts. Let's suppose I want to measure V2. You know, maybe I've I've changed the the polarity of my variable. Maybe someone chose a different polarity. Here's V2. Um, opposite polarity of V1, but let's say we have the, ac the actual same voltage across circuit element X. So again, I would take the voltmeter polarity, match it up with the reference direction polarity. So if I want to measure V2, I have to take the positive terminal here and connect it to the positive side of V2. I'm trying to measure V2. The negative side of the voltmeter connected to the negative side um, of V2. So I would do that. And in this case, you would see negative five volts. Right. For, for V2, V2 would equal negative 5 volts because, well, it has the opposite polarity of positive 5 volts with this, with this polarity. Okay. When you actually use meters, here's one type of meter. This is a handheld multimeter. Um, usually, you, you connect the probes between either a negative or a common. Uh, that would be the black probe. Black is usually negative. Connect the red probe, which is usually positive, to the V input the V terminal, right? These other ones with amp and milliamp and microamp, those are used for measuring current. And um, that's how you'd measure current. And if you have a, a lab grade multimeter that looks like this, this is similar to one you have in your lab, you have nice equipment in lab, um, then you find the terminals that you need to use. Here's, here's a terminal that has a little ground symbol. We'll talk about that and it says low. This says high and it has a V next to it. So you'd hook your, your terminals here. Okay, let's talk about measuring current. Let's talk about how to measure the current I1, which goes down this wire from left to right through circuit element X. Right. So in order to measure current, you actually have to have the current go through the meter. So the first thing you have to do is break the circuit. At that point, current cannot flow. So your current has gone to zero, right? I1 cannot flow out of the end of a wire. It has to flow somewhere. And here, I just broken that circuit. So I1 actually goes to zero until I insert the meter. The meter itself looks like, it looks like a wire. It, 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 um, it has theoretically zero resistance. We'll talk about that. But uh, what I would do is connect the ammeter like this because the ammeter measures current through itself from its positive terminal to its negative terminal. Okay, so so the meter measures the ammeter measures current through itself from positive to negative, so from left to right through this meter. So that's the same direction as the reference direction for I1. If the meter says three amps. And you have three amps going left to right. I1 has the same reference direction. I1 is three amps. Okay. If I wanted to measure I2, I2, the only difference is I've flipped the reference direction of this of the variable for current. Um, then I would have to break the circuit and insert the meter so that current goes through the meter, right? This, the, the same direction as this arrow, this arrow I2. I want it to go, well, right to left and then into the positive terminal of the meter and out of the negative terminal of the meter like this, because this meter measures current through itself from positive to negative. And so this is how you would measure current I2. And if you had the same setup, the same current, then I2 would be negative three amps in this case. Looking at the real meters, right? Here is a, an ammeter. Uh, it's actually the ammeter setting of a multimeter, and you, you you have to you have to disconnect if you if you were measuring voltage, you'd have to disconnect that test lead from the voltage terminal and plug it into the either milliamp, microamp, or amp terminal, depending upon what scale you want to use. On the lab grade multimeter. Um, this meter here shows, well, there's a, there's, here's I, this says I right here, that's current. You'd have to connect your positive lead, your red lead to one of these two 
terminals, whether you're measuring maximum of three amps or maximum of 10 amps, and your negative lead stays at that low or ground uh, terminal there. Usually, multimeters have two positive terminals for current, and that's because you use the appropriate terminal for the maximum current you expect so that you can get, you can pick up an appropriate range and get accurate results. And if you exceed the maximum current, uh, you'll blow the fuse. Uh, that's what I mentioned in the video. Like if you blow a fuse, no big deal. Um, you just have to replace the fuse and then the meter will work again. Okay. All right. So I have hit the wall on time for this lecture. Uh, so what I would like to do now is in closing, so check out the assignments. Uh, Pre-lab one is due Thursday. Each student has to submit a pre-lab. So take a look at that assignment. If you have any questions, stop by office hours on that. Um, uh, quiz one is due Friday, homework one is due Monday. I know it's kind of bunched up here, but they, they should be uh, uh, basic problems. If you have any questions, please post them to Slack and I will be um, on Slack answering any questions so that everybody can see uh, questions and answers. Um, for homework, check the due date, check the due time, make sure that you know what date and time homework is due. Use the seventh edition, not the global edition, not the international edition, it has to be the seventh edition. If you have other editions, that's fine for reading generally, but Find someone with the seventh edition so that you can get the proper homework problems. Check the Slack link on Canvas. Um, that's where I'll, I will ask that you post problems. If you email me with a problem, I'll say, hey, can you post this on Slack so that everybody can, can see the answer. So in closing, thank you for joining the live class. It's great to have you. It's great to get the class kicked off. I'm excited about the semester. Um, I hope everything is working out well. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see the slides. Um, if anything isn't, working out well, please let me know and I will I will correct it if I can. Um, I will start office hours in, in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to join, please join. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.